I don't remember in high school whether I had the opportunity to see two congressional candidates. It's a great opportunity for you. So, again, my name is Keith Rothfuss. I am running for Congress here in Pennsylvania's 12th congressional district. And every time I get, can you hear me okay? Every time I get to introduce myself to a group of voters, I always tell people this is a job interview. And in our system of a representative democracy, representative republic, uh, it's the people here who hire their representatives. So basically, I'm one of your applicants uh, for, for your hiring decision that you're going to make on November 6th or beforehand if you file by absentee. And so as with any job interview, it's incumbent upon me to tell you a little bit about me and then to have the opportunity for the employer, you will be the employer of the individual that we send to Washington, to ask questions. And so a little bit about me. I live here in Allegheny County. I've been married to my wife, Elsie, a graduate of the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. I uh, live here in Allegheny County raising our six children, uh, four girls and two boys. Uh, our oldest daughter has already graduated college. Uh, she graduated from Pepperdine University in California last spring after serving as the, the college's or university's student body president. So we're awfully proud of her and the leadership role that she was taking at her university. And I kind of wonder if she's like the furthest person east who's ever held that position. But she actually beat three boys um, for, that, for that position, so I was awfully proud of her. Uh, um, I have uh, three younger daughters, uh, one who is a freshman in high school, and then I have a 14-year-old daughter and a no, yeah, yeah, 14 years of freshman, then I have a 10 year old daughter and a 5 year old daughter, my baby Alice. And I have two boys, uh, one who's a sophomore in college and one who is a senior in college. So I certainly uh, appreciate those who are worried about their kids in college and grandkids in college. By trade, I'm an attorney. Uh, contrary to some of the ads that have been out there, I'm not a Wall Street attorney. I work on Stanwick Street uh, in Pittsburgh. Funny, funny. And, and, uh, I, I do a lot of. Uh, Commercial transactions, um, uh, India, forming companies, filing paperwork, uh, Department of Corporations Bureau, uh, partnership statements, uh, writing operating agreements where people get together and form businesses. Also negotiate some contracts, uh, negotiate software licenses, supply agreements, that kind of thing. And one of my clients happens to be the Bank of New York Mellon, which is uh, how they make this allegation that I'm a Wall Street attorney. Not understanding that there are 7,500 people here in Western Pennsylvania who work for the Bank of New York Mellon with, with good jobs. Um, so no, I'm a Stanwood Street guy. In any event, as I negotiate contracts, uh, uh, which I've been doing uh, uh, the better part of the last 15 years, you understand when you go into a, a negotiating session that your client has asked you to get two or three things that are so core that have to be in that contract. You understand that the person coming in from the other side, the man or woman you're going to be negotiating against, pretty much has the same directive from their client, that they have to have two or three, three things in that deal. And so what happens is you have to sit around that table and negotiate. You're not going to get 100% of what you're looking for, and neither is the other person. But the goal is to achieve a workable agreement that you can both be satisfied with, shake hands, and get out and start doing business. That's what we do in the private sector. We get things done. Unfortunately, that's not happening in Washington, D.C., and I think we need some new leadership. I had some, uh, a woman came up to me the other day. I said, why are you doing this? Why are you putting this, your, you, yourself through this, your family through this? And uh, it's simple. We're on the wrong course. We have policies coming out of Washington that, that continue to pro promote big government solutions, big debt, uh, and it's not working. We have chronically high unemployment, exploding national debt. Uh, the debt trajectory is truly frightening. Uh, so we have to have a new direction. And I think that, that, you know, when we send leaders to Washington, not to pass the buck to the next generation, to take care of the problems that we have to take care of right now, we need to be doing that. I'm also guided by, you remember, how many were here last time, two years ago? I talked about the Alice test. And, and I named it after my, my, my daughter, Alice, and, and it talked about how I would, I would consider pieces of legislation, you know, looking at the Constitution, seeing what the authority of the Congress is, evaluating whether it's a good idea, and, and, and then who's paying for it. If it's something that we're going to ask the three-year-olds and the five-year-olds to pay for 30 years down the road, this better be very important uh, uh, for our country. I've added another Alice to that test, not Alice here, but my mom, Alice. Uh, my mom is, we named my daughter Alice after, after my mom. 
And, and given what's happening with our healthcare system, I'm very concerned about my mom house. And so, for example, uh, when I look at Obamacare, when I look at the way it's going to micromanage our health care from Washington, D.C. with a one-size-fits-all solution, when I, and I'm so glad that we're getting to have this discussion this year about something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board and the cuts to Medicare, because frankly, I was talking about that two years ago and folks weren't listening. But we understand now, it's all come out, that, that one of the ways to pay for the massive expansion in the federal en 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 enrollment in, in the health care system is to take $700 billion out of Medicare over the next 10 years. And don't worry, because they're going to have the Independent Payment Advisory Board manage costs. A bureau of 15 unelected bureaucrats. Which, you know, I'm very concerned what that means for our seniors' health care. As I tell everybody, the first step, the first step to saving Medicare is to repeal Obamacare. My opponent disagrees. Uh, um, he's voted more than 20 times to keep Obamacare in place. And he specifically voted to keep the Independent Payment Advisory Board in place. So there are significant differences between us, and we get to have this debate. Uh, we'll be debating tomorrow night if anybody wants to drive out to Beaver County, Beaver County, uh, Beaver Penn State campus. And uh, I look forward to that discussion. But with that, that background, I'd be happy to address some of the, the issues that are outlined on your presentation. What three issues do you think are the most controversial that will be addressed in the House of Representatives during the next term? Do you think they will be resolved? Well, I think that the three most controversial issues we're looking at are taxes. You know, we have a huge tax cliff coming on January 1st, where there's going to be a massive increase in tax taxes. Uh, not only the expiration of the 2001 and 2003 tax rates, uh, expiration of the payroll tax cut, uh, new taxes coming into Obamacare. Uh, so all these taxes coming down at once. Uh, that's going to be a very controversial issue we have to address over the next uh, session. Obamacare itself is a very controversial piece of legislation which we have to address. And finally, the debt. You know, this debt trajectory we're on, that we, where we've added, you know, in the last, uh, uh, let's see, 11 years, 12 years, you know, $10 trillion to the national debt, 5.5 trillion just over the last three and a half years, it, this threatens to swallow the entire economy. And so that's a very controversial we have to be addressing. Do I think they can be resolved? I think with the right leadership, yes, they can be resolved. Um, on taxes, President Obama himself said never raise taxes in a slow economy. And we know from experience when you do raise taxes in a slow economy, things go slower. We all like to talk about the 1990s and, and how we finally got things going then. Well, a little history is, I think, insightful. In 1992, when President Clinton was elected, our economy was growing at a 4.2% growth rate. It was coming out of a recession, things were growing. And in January, in, in, in January and February of, of 1993, we've had a huge tax increase. And what happened to the GDP growth rate? Well, the GDP growth rate in 1993 dropped to 1.1%. There was a lot of talk about a healthcare takeover at that time. Um, and then we had the big you know, turnover in the House of Representatives and the Senate in 1994. And in 1995, that new Congress delivered on one of the pledges that President Clinton had made during the 1992 campaign, a middle class tax cut. And they also cut capital gains. And the economy started to really kick in. And the economy grew. And we added revenues. And we, we, we put a lid on spending. And we were, we were able to move into surplus. You know, with the right leadership, we, that can happen again. But you don't grow, the, you don't grow this economy to generate revenues by continuing to add more and more government and more and more spending. You know, I called this recovery, or what, what you can call it the last few years, a, a government-centered recovery. You know, there's another model. It's a freedom-centered recovery, an outside Washington-centered recovery, one that reduces taxes, one that reduces regulations, one that keeps a lid on spending. And you saw the GDP growth rates in the 1980s. Some quarters up at 7%, 8%. People say that we can't grow anymore. I disagree with that fundamentally. With the right policies in place, we have to get this economy growing again. And that's going to help us fix these other issues, such as health care, such as the debt. Uh, will they be resolved again with the right leadership? You know, we have a situation now where we have a Senate that refuses to even pass a budget. 
three years running. That's not leadership. This would never happen in the private sector. Can you imagine going to your boss and saying, we can't get this budget done? <laughs> Can you imagine you know, going to a board of directors and saying, hey, we need a continuing resolution? <laughs> so we can continue doing business. They've been passing the buck. It's been a Republican problem. It's been a Democrat problem. Uh, you know, it's been since 1994 that Congress has gotten its budget done on time and spending bills done on time. It's, it's actually fairly simple. What's supposed to happen in the spring, the, the uh, House passes a budget, and the Senate is supposed to pass a budget. And then the two houses are supposed to get together and do a reconciliation and come up with a spending blueprint. And from that, they're supposed to come up with the spending bills that fund the government, 12 bills in all. And it's all supposed to be done by September 30th, because the country's fiscal year starts on October 1st. The last time they got all that work done by September 30th was in 1994. That's inexcusable. I remember last year after the Republicans won the House of Representatives, I've gotten to know some of these guys, and uh, I heard that Speaker Boehner was sending them on a five-week recess in August. And I called him up and said, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're going on recess. Is your job done yet? Well, what do you mean? How many of the spending bills have you done so far? Three. Well, wait a minute. You're taking a five-week recess. You're going to be back here September 8th, 9th, 10th, whatever it was. And then in three weeks, you expect to pass nine more spending bills, send them over to the Senate, have them work on it, pass it, get together, do a reconciliation, all by October 1st? Well, Harry Reid won't do anything anyway. I don't care. You know, it, you know it's your job to get it done. We're, let Harry Reid worry about his problem. You know, if, if you're in a private sector, in, in a company, and, and there's responsibilities for different departments, you know, in, in one department says, well, they're not going to get their work done, so why don't I have to do my work? That's nonsense. You have to roll up your sleeves, like we do in the private sector, work some long days, you are our employees, as Plinius would say, um, and get the job done. So will these problems be resolved? Again, we need leadership. We need leadership to resolve these problems. And that's why I support Governor Romney, because I think Governor Romney can provide that necessary leadership to get things done. The 112th Congress has been gridlocked. Do you see this changing the new Congress, changing in the new Congress? And how can you plan, or how do you plan to represent your constituents if the gridlock continues? Again, you look at the Senate, and if, if, if Harry Reid can't even pass a budget, that's a real problem. Uh, um, you know, going forward, you know, we're going to have a Republican majority in the House of Representatives next year. It's my hope that we will have a Republican majority in the Senate, so we won't have that kind of gridlock. And it's my hope that we'll have a Republican president, so we can go about getting back, getting back to getting America back to work again. Um, there's something about, you know, encouraging individuals to shift their paradigms, to try to get people to, to see things from a different perspective. I, I think, you know, you look at the healthcare debate that we had in 2000, I mean, I think there were mistakes made. I, I think people got entrenched in, on, on one side or the other, and, and nothing constructive and bipartisan got done. And I think, perhaps, maybe, somebody should have stood up and say, hey, the president has raised some important issues. We might not agree with how to get it done. We have a different way to get it done, but at least the issue's out there. Let's acknowledge that the issue's there. And then let's you know, talk about ways to get there. And, and I don't think that dialogue was happening. You know, one side said it, it had its way, the other side had its way. Uh, uh, I, I think we need to be more open and more talking with each other about these issues. Um, how do I plan to represent the constituents of the good luck continues? Work hard. Work hard. Try to encourage fellow members of Congress to shift that paradigm, to see things in a different perspective. Not to run the TV all the time, it, 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 with the TV cameras all the time, and, and, and start to hammer people. You're fortunate. You live in one of the few competitive, or relatively few competitive districts in the country. What part of the problem is, is the way districts have been gerrymandered. So you have safe Republican seats and safe Democrat seats. And the, those in the safe seats get to just lob these uh, uh, verbal bombs at each other. And, and in, in the competitive districts, we actually have to get out and defend the ideas. You get to be a participant. There are probably like 60 or 70 seats in this country like this. 
So consider your fortune, you, yourselves fortunate, because you get to really participate, and, and, and your voice makes a difference in these. It's incumbent upon us in, the, in these swing districts to make the arguments, because we, it, 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 it's we, we representatives in the swing district who can try to pull folks together. What issues within the scope of the House of Representative activi activities are your personal passions? How do they become personal to you? Health care is a huge passion for me. Uh, as you remember, may remember, uh, when I spoke last time, I talked a little about my experience with cancer. Those of you in this room who have had that diagnosis, you know, you know what it hit you like a ton of bricks that day. For me, it was December 1st, 2006. It was a week after I had my appendix out. And I had gone to the hospital around Thanksgiving, just feeling a little funny down around my appendix. And uh, they said they, they'd take a CAT scan and they said it wasn't plain, let's take it out. They took it out and the doctor said, good thing we got it, it was ruptured. I didn't feel it, so I don't know what they were, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. A week later, I sit down and the doctor says, mucinous adenocarcinoma. And uh, is that cancer, doc? Yes, it is. And he started going through the different different uh, uh, options that I had. Well, being a fan of Google, I went home and plugged in cancer of the appendix and learned pretty quickly that this was a very rare disease that kills 75% of people within five years. And that very often it's misdiagnosed when women as ovarian cancer. Uh, doctors don't typically see it, so they don't know what it is. Uh, what happens when the appendix ruptures is that it plants seeds around the abdomen. And those cancer cells start to grow and they start to suffocate the small intestine. There was an American doctor 30 years ago who studied this problem. And he came up with an innovative treatment called heated interperitoneal chemotherapy. And I found this all doing my research. There's probably a dozen, dozen or so patients that offer this, this uh, procedure, UPMC being one of them. I had my treatments done at Washington Hospital Center down in DC. This is where the pioneer was practicing, Paul Sugarbaker. Uh, and I had what was known as the mother of all surgeries, where they gave me an internal heated chemotherapy bath. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I just had my fifth annual CAT scan in March. I can say I'm clean, I can say I'm cured. But it's because of American medicine and the innovation we had here. Uh, um, you know, I was being treated in that hospital at the same time as people from Bosnia, people from Germany, people from across the United States, all coming to that center because of the innovation we had. You look at Canada, universal coverage. I wasn't going to Toronto for my treatment. You look at the UK, universal coverage. I wasn't going to London for my treatment. I got that right here in the USA. We are the pioneers in innovation. We can't lose that. I'm very concerned with the structure of the health care bill. When you have things like the Independent Payment Advisory Board making decisions on what a doctor's going to get paid, making decisions on what gets covered, unelected bureaucrats, unaccountable to the U.S. Congress. You know, it's, 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 it's in the devils of the details, but I frankly believe that there are constitutional issues with the way this thing is structured and, and the lack of Congress to have an effective check on it. And that will yet to be challenged uh, in court uh, should, should it not be repealed. 158 new bureaus, bureaucracies, agencies. Something called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It sounds great. Who could be opposed to research, right? Until you start to read the bill. The purpose of this institute is to help doctors, patients, and policymakers make informed healthcare decisions. I'm sorry, I don't want a policymaker making the informed healthcare decision that I want to be making with my family and my doctor. You know, Obamacare is a string of empty and broken promises. The president promised it would have universal coverage. We're going to have more than 20 million people uninsured in 10 years. He said it would lower premiums by 2,500 per family per year. They're actually going up more than 2,000 per family per year. He said that if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. We know that by 2018, 4 million people, according to the Medicare trustees report, will be losing their Medicare Advantage plans. But he promised, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. It's not true. He promised it wouldn't have a middle class tax increase. Well, the Supreme Court blew that one up. It's a big middle class tax increase. Not true. He said it would decrease the deficit. Well, 
The CBO is now saying it's going to increase the deficit over 10 years by hundreds of billions of dollars. Not true. A string of empty and broken promises. There's another way to go. We don't want to have the government micromanaging our health care system, one-sixth of the, of, of the economy. And so I'm for the repeal of Obamacare. Plain and simple. If there are discrete items that we need to address, such as pre-existing conditions, believe me, that's very personal to me as a cancer survivor. We can address those, but not with a, 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 a more than $1.7 trillion cost over 10 years. So we have to repeal, we have to replace it with common sense, patient-centered reforms, not bureaucrat-centered reforms. Uh, um, that's one of my big passions. The other big passion I have is economic growth. <coughs> Nobody talks about economic growth anymore. And that's how we pay for the critical social services we need. When we have chronically high unemployment, people aren't paying social security taxes. People aren't paying Medicare taxes. People aren't pay paying income taxes. You know, we have to get this economy growing in. It, the, la the last uh, report was 1.3% GDP growth. You can't even stay even with 1.3% GDP growth. We need to get back to four, five, six, seven percent. We can. We can relight America. We can relight that. We like that market. We like the job market with the right policies. I've gone for three hours. We feel Obamacare. It's been a wet blanket on the job market from day one. Congressional Budget Office says we're going to lose 800,000 jobs by 2020 because of Obamacare. Half of businesses are not hiring because of Obamacare, according to a National Federation of Independent Businesses uh, survey. This is a group that's endorsed my campaign, NFIB represents small businesses across the country. It's a group that endorsed Jason Altmaier two years ago. It's endorsed me this time. Uh, um, they, they understand the cost that businesses are, 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 are facing. Uh, um, we have to repeal Obamacare. We have to reform our tax and, tax and spend policies to make us the most competitive place in the world to want to have a business. Right now, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. And this is a world economy. We want to attract investment here. We want people to invest here so they can, they can build factories and add jobs. But we don't do that with high corporate taxes. And we have to fix our spending policies. When you have the federal government borrowing 42 cents of every dollar in spending, sucking up that capital into the government sector as opposed to the private sector where it can be deployed to create jobs. And we finally, we have to roll back regulations. That's my third out. Repeal Obamacare, reform our tax and spend policies, roll back the regulations. It's affecting every area of our economy. Pittsburgh's unique in this country. We have a high concentration of high-level companies involved in three major areas that are under assault by the federal government. Energy, healthcare, and financial services. And I've talked to individuals in these industries and in others. Manufacturing, I've talked to individuals. Education, I've talked to individuals. And the theme is the same. It's the regulation. These experts in Washington think they know better than us. And therefore, we're losing an art of things. In healthcare, we're losing the art of medicine. You know, there's a science of medicine. You know, the basic science of, of what should work, what may not work. But then